Hi, everyone. Welcome back for another episode of Web3 Talks. My name is Ray Fiel, and today we have the great and powerful and the one and only Peter Schiff. So thank you so much, Peter, for joining today. I don't know if I'm actually the Wizard of Oz, but thanks for having me. No problem. All right, so we're going to walk through a little bit um, of your background before we get started in the conversation. So way back when, uh, Peter started out as a stockbroker at Shearson Lehman Brothers. Uh, and I'm sure there are other things that I'm missing, but from uh, from what I'm aware of, uh, founded Shift Gold, and then of course currently is the CEO and the Chief Global Strategist at Euro Pacific Asset Management. Um, Peter, is there anything you want to add to that before we get going? Because I'm sure there are other things that we can call out that might be interesting. Um, I've just been in the investment business pretty much in college. I uh, got started in commodities and became a stockbroker. Then I set up my own broker dealer, which I I, I owned a broker dealer up until uh, 2017 or so, 2018, when I, I sold it because I moved to Puerto Rico. Just wanted to get out of some of these businesses. I sold Ship Gold, still have an interest in it, but I, I sold it. Um, and I kept the asset management company, which is based out of Puerto Rico. The only other company I had was a bank. And unfortunately, uh, that's that's a long story. I can get into it a little bit if you want, but the bank is uh, is out of business, so I don't I don't have that anymore. Um, I just have a bunch of lawsuits that I'm filing <laughs> against a lot of people, but uh, but the bank is gone. But my main business is the asset management business uh, that I run out of Puerto Rico. Awesome, and we'll we'll definitely dive into some of those details uh, later in the conversation because we we love we love hot takes and and uh, breaking news. So. I like to start the conversation out with uh, kind of your origin story. And so you've clearly accomplished a tremendous amount in the financial sector and of course are uh, definitely an icon and a visionary. So why don't we rewind the clock back and you can walk us back through maybe some of the pivotal milestones that kind of turned you on into obviously your career of finance. Well, I mean, I'm kind of in the fringe of uh, the investment world because I'm a contrarian. But <laughs> Um, I guess what really got me going on it and maybe I, you know, raised my profile was during the 1990s, during the dot com bubble, I was uh, very skeptical and very critical of what I was seeing in, uh, in the markets. And so I was advising people to get rid get out of the NASDAQ, you know, in fact, when the NASDAQ got up to around 5,000, I mean, I was predicting that it would fall. Uh, by 80%. And I was very negative on um, uh, the dot-com stocks in particular. I and mean, I said most of them would go bankrupt. And uh, that prediction was 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 pretty close. I mean, the NASDAQ fell to, I think, 1,000, 1,100. I was actually, my target initially was like 500. You know, I thought it would get even lower. But then mm -hmm. the Fed slashed interest rates down to 1% and started printing a lot of money. And so I I became bullish. But I, I, I was only bullish because of what the Fed was doing. I thought that the Fed had made a mistake and the Fed should not have slashed interest rates like that. And they should have let more air come out of that bubble. Uh, and we would have been in much better shape today had, had they done that. In fact, we wouldn't have had the housing bubble. That's where I you know, really rose to a lot of notoriety was in my criticism of Fed policy leading up to the 2008 financial crisis i was very vocal all over the internet writing articles about the mistakes that the fed had made with one percent interest rates about the um the bubble that had been inflated in housing and how the entire economy was distorted i was warning about a coming financial crisis i was predicting the bankruptcy of fannie and freddie uh, i was predicting problems on wall street i predicted the demise of subprime i set up a hedge fund and we shorted it uh, we had a thousand percent the gain in that fund in 2007. Uh, you know, I wrote a book uh, forecasting the 2008 financial crisis. It came out in February uh, of 2007. Crash proof how to profit from the coming economic collapse. Originally, the book was just going to be about the housing market and mm -hmm. you know, Fed there and, and the financial crisis. But I, I wanted to make it a broader book so it would have greater appeal. Uh, and, and it did become a New York Times bestseller. It actually sold a lot more copies a year after it was published because it was still on the shelves when the financial crisis happened. And then it was one of the only books that was there. So it was it started it got a whole new life because it did come out in February of 07. You know, the financial crisis really hit in the summer of 08. Um, 
but I was very accurate in uh, my fit criticism of Greenspan and Bernanke. But also more importantly and more relevant to today, I was very critical of the Fed's response to the crisis that it created. I was a big critic of TARP, of quantitative easing. I, I warned back in 2009 and 2010 that QE would never end, that it was a uh, monetary roach motel, that we would have more QEs than Rocky movies, uh, that <laughs> creating a economy addicted to cheap money and that the debt bubble would get bigger and bigger. And I said eventually inflation was going to run out of control and the Fed would be in a very difficult position because there'd be no way to rein in the inflation because the economy would be too levered up to survive the cure. Because in order to cure inflation, you not only need positive real interest rates, which would mean interest rates you know, north of 10%, you know, right now they're not even close, but you would also need significant cuts in government spending. And, and none of that is going to happen, uh, you know, given the degree of leverage that we have in this phony economy. And, and so my, my second book, which also was a New York Times bestseller, uh, The Real Crash, America's Coming Bankruptcy, I wrote that book in around 2013 because a lot of people thought that the, the 2008 financial crisis was the crash that I was referring to in my original book. And I wanted to remind people that, no, that wasn't the crash. The crash that I was referring to is the one we haven't had yet. The crash that I was referring to is the one that happens when the dollar crashes because inflation runs out of control and we mm -hmm. get a sovereign debt crisis. So that bigger crisis it surprises me that here it is 2022 uh you know i wrote the first book in 2007 and what i really thought was going to happen hasn't even happened yet but it's going to happen and in fact because we were able to kick the can down the road for as many years as we have it's going to be much more catastrophic than what my thought process was back then because we have a much bigger debt bubble and we've made a lot more mistakes uh, during you know the 12, 13 years that we had uh, zero percent rates, uh, and and so this is a complete disaster. Mm -hmm. And in, in order to avoid this disaster, we're going to have to have an even bigger disaster because the inflation problem is going to get much worse, and the risk is hyperinflation. Yep, yep. Well, thank you for walking us through that. There are clearly a ton of work has gone into all those those milestones that you've achieved. So. Um, in present day, obviously the last two years, we have, I think, experienced, and a lot, maybe a lot of people in the audience here, a lot of hurt that, that we haven't experienced before, um, depending on how old people are. And so have you, do you see this as different than like previous economic crises that we've experienced over the last few major cycles? Or is this just the expected outcome as you're describing? Well, what's different about it is the size now, right? I mean, it's it's a bigger problem than what we had in 2000 or 2008 or 2020 with COVID. You know, where we are now is, you know, the problems are much bigger. But I think the significant difference is that inflation is at a level that no longer allows the Fed the luxury of being able to you know, rescue the markets or the economy by printing money and slashing interest rates, because that actually is inflation. Mm -hmm. If you understand, the Fed's solution to every problem has been inflation. That's what the Fed does. It, it creates inflation. Inflation is the expansion of the money supply. So the Fed inflates every time there's a problem and it inflates our way out of the problem. But when they do that, they actually prevent the problem from, from really being solved. They just kind of kick the can down the road and let the problem get worse. But at this time, because the Fed has already created so much inflation and what gave them the leeway to be able to do that and the, the pretense, they kept pointing to the CPI as flawed as it is. Mm -hmm. And they said, hey, inflation is below 2%. That's not good. We need 2%. That's our mandate. And so we can print all this money and stimulate the economy because it kills two birds with one stone. It can help us revive the economy and stimulate growth. Plus, we can get up to our inflation goal, which is, you know, we need to get up to 2%. Well, that was always BS. I mean, we don't need 2% inflation. I mean, 1% inflation is better than 2%. Zero is better than one. Minus one is better than zero. Prices going down is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. 
Uh, it's good for everybody. It's good for business. They sell more products. It's good for consumers. They can buy more stuff. Everybody wins when you have falling prices. Um, but the government, you know, used that, manufactured that lie uh, to, to make an excuse. But now that inflation is way above 2%, they no longer have a pretense for creating more inflation. Clearly, mm -hmm. we don't need more inflation. Inflation is too high. And so that takes the Fed out of the game. Now we get a stock market crash, we get a recession, we get a financial crisis. The Fed can't do anything. And if the Fed can't do anything, the government can't do anything. Because where does the government get money to stimulate or to bail out? From the Fed. Mm -hmm. Well, the Fed's mm -hmm. not giving the government money anymore. In fact, the Fed is actually billing the government. A lot of people don't rec realize this, but now that the Fed is raising interest rates, it's losing a ton of money on its port on its nine trillion dollar balance sheet. Um, and but while interest rates were at zero and you know they, they had this big balance sheet and they were collecting all this income, they were making money. And so they were sending Congress a check, you know, a lot of money, which helped offset the deficits. Now the Fed is losing billions, tens of billions, soon hundreds of billions. They're sending Congress a bill. The Fed needs a bailout from the U.S. government. So, you know, this is the very op different situation that we've been in. This is the end game, right? The end of the road. This is, you know, where we pay the piper. Yeah. Uh, I believe in this, uh, of course, your, your assessment of like the market and this philosophy. So are there any other... Uh, like economic leaders that you find and this is this message has resonated with like in the fed or in the government because this to me seems obvious and i also feel frustrated that the leadership has not taken a dramatic turn or keeps like postponing the pain look nobody look donald trump when he ran for president you know said some things you know like this criticized uh, janet yellen and the fed for inflating a bubble and keeping interest rates too low and creating a phony economy so he was good at pointing out those problems when he wasn't president. But mm -hmm. of course, when he became president, he wanted Jerome Powell to do everything that he criticized Janet Yellen for doing. Uh, because once he became in power, he recognized that if the Fed did the right thing, we were going to have a massive economic implosion. And he didn't want to get blamed for that. He wanted to pretend that he presided over the greatest economy in the history of America. Mm -hmm. So he can pretend that he made America great. He didn't make anything great. I mean, he made our debt great. I mean, it made it greater. <laughs> Donald Trump ran on a platform of shrinking the trade deficit. We had record trade deficits under Trump. Now they're bigger now under Biden because Biden has already broken Trump's record, but Trump <laughs> broke, broke Obama's record. in yeah. trade. Deficits. So trade deficits got bigger, budget deficits got bigger. Uh, the bubble and, and what did trump want he wanted zero percent interest rates he wanted negative rates he wanted quantitative easing so he became a champion of everything he criticized so it's very difficult for anyone in government to be honest with the american public because you know the voters really don't have the intellect for honesty they mm -hmm. you know they they don't have uh the, the the attention span to be told the truth about how bad things are so Everybody wants something for nothing from the government. They don't want to hear, oh, God, you're going to have to suffer. This is some bitter tasting medicine, but don't worry. You know, you'll get healthy eventually. Yeah. Americans don't want that. They want, you know, they, they want to get rich quick scheme. You know, they want, mm -hmm. you know, they don't want to exercise and diet. You know, they want a, a cream that they could just rub on, a miracle cream to get rid of the cellulite or whatever. They, they, they don't want to actually. <laughs> So, uh, so that being said, you're not going to find politicians. Now, there was one, right? I mean, Rand, uh, Ron Paul was a friend of mine, and he was in Congress for a long time, and he ran for president. I was actually the economic advisor when he ran the first time in 2008. And if you remember, you know, he ran, that was you know, 2007. He was out there talking about the coming financial crisis. Nobody listened to him, right? We were talking about it back then. It was around the corner. Uh, he was the only one warning about it. I mean, his son is in the Senate now, who I'm also friendly with. But, you know, I mean, there's, there's really not that much he could do. He's a little bit more pragmatic than his dad was. So he's trying to, you know, influence people more subtly. But, you know, it's very difficult message to sell mm -hmm. politicians, uh, you know, because the Republicans, they want more spending. I mean, you know, you don't see the Republicans. I mean, they're, they're, they're saying, oh, 
Biden is creating infl inflation with his spending. Well, what about all this Trump spending? He didn't cut any government spending. He, government spending rose sharply while Trump was president. The deficits rose. Uh, all of the COVID bailouts, which were a mistake, were started by Trump. He signed the, 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 the PPP was a disaster. It never should have happened. I mean, we did the opposite of what we should have done during COVID. What we should have done during COVID, well, obviously we shouldn't have done anything. We shouldn't have locked down. We shouldn't have <laughs> quarantined. That was, we should have done you know, what Sweden did. And I said that at the time. But if we were going to make the mistake of ordering people not to go to work, we should have allowed the money supply to contract and allowed the economy to implode. Because if we're not going to go to work and we're not going to produce stuff, well, then we have to have a massive recession. People have to stop spending because they're no longer earning. They're no longer producing. But we did the, the, the most reckless thing you could have possibly done. We told people not to go to work, but then we sent them checks. And many people were getting checks that were double or triple what they were earning when they actually were productive. And we said, hey, you don't have a job, but here's a bunch of money. Go out and buy stuff. Buy what? Nobody was making anything. All they were making was money. So we created massive inflation. Uh, they should have been contracting the money supply along with a contraction in the production of goods and services. But, you know, we couldn't do that because, you know, banks would have failed. I mean, you know, we're all levered up. Yeah. We, we couldn't have survived that. And so we created inflation and we're mm -hmm. paying the price. But the inflation that we have today is not just because of what happened after COVID. I mean, we've been creating this inflation for you know more than a decade. And we're just starting to feel, you know, the beginning of it. It's going to get so much worse than yeah. what we really experienced. So I want to talk about that part, actually, because, you know, clearly we are under so much pressure right now, obviously, with inflation rates and you know, increased cost of goods. And obviously, energy prices over in Europe are inflating. And then, you know, obviously, the dollar becoming so strong is going to create so much uh, repayment tension with our foreign you know, markets that aren't going to be able to afford to, to pay back maybe some of the, the loans that are being made. So where do you think this is headed in the next like six to six months to a year? Because I, I agree that we're going to continue going downward before we start to recover. Yeah, the, the strong dollar is really hurting the rest of the world. It's helping America considerably because if we didn't have a strong dollar, prices would be going up a lot more. Mm -hmm. Interest rates would have gone up a lot more. So the strength of the dollar is helping Americans, but it's hurting everybody else. I mean, we're, we're, it's our gain and it's their loss because we're exporting a lot of our inflation to the rest of the world. Now, if the dollar was a normal currency based on the economic fundamentals, the dollar would be tanking. But it's not because it's still got the mystique of a safe haven. It's the reserve currency. And so the dollar keeps going up. And so Americans take those appreciated dollars and they go around the world, and they buy stuff, and they bid up prices, but we're not producing stuff. We have record trade deficits. So we're, we're sucking goods out of the global economy and we're not paying for them by putting goods into the global economy. We go to the world and we take all their stuff and we just give them paper. And now they don't have that stuff anymore. So the supply of stuff goes down outside the United States. And it goes up inside the United States. So we get more stuff. So we have lower prices. The rest of the world has less stuff. They have higher prices. And, and, and so this is putting more downward pressure on their economies, on their bond markets. But at some point, this is going to break. Um, because at some point, the rising interest rates. So look, bond yields just hit new 14-year highs again today. Uh, the yields are now like four and a quarter on the 10-year treasury or, you know, 30 year treasury mortgage rates are now probably seven and a quarter. You know, they'll be 8% by the end of the year, probably 10% by early next year. Uh, the, the fed funds rate will you know, move up to 5% then 6%. We, there's no way that the nation can pay this interest. It's just too big a burden on the economy. There's too much debt. There's no way to service it. The national debt, 31 trillion it's financed with short-term paper a lot of that paper is rolling over in the next year and you know it's going to go from 25 basis points to 450 500 basis points i mean you're talking about a massive increase in the debt by next year the government's going to be spending well over a trillion dollars a year just on interest on the national debt 
Um, you know, we already have a two trillion dollar deficit. I mean, it, 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 you, these numbers are too big, but corporations can't finance the debt. Uh, state and local governments have got tons of debt. Individuals have record amounts of debt, record low savings, record high debt, credit card debt, auto loans, student loans, mortgage debt. So at some point, you know, the Fed is going to turn its attention from inflation to this economic implosion, this financial crisis. And when that happens, the dollar is going to drop like a stone. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then inflation is going to take off. And then I think this whole process is going to is going to escalate because as the dollar really starts to fall and inflation really starts to rise i mean that's going to push put up a lot of upward pressure on interest rates and then the fed's going to have to print even more money to buy even more bonds to stop the rates from rising mm -hmm. and, and as they do that they just create more inflation and they create even more selling in the bonds they're creating inflation to buy so you get into this vicious circle yeah uh, so you know we, we've got a real sovereign debt and currency crisis coming and this big rally in the dollar right now this is just a head fake i mean this fact that people are buying the dollar um is just a allowing our problems to get worse because we just you know we just go deeper into debt we borrow more money and import more products yeah yeah so knowing that then because uh yeah <laughs> it's it's looking very grim so how are you positioning yourself because it doesn't seem like there is going to be a way out does it make sense well, to just uh, sit in cash? I know you're big on gold, so we could talk about that too. Yeah, no, there, there, there is no way out that isn't going to be very painful. I mean, there is a proper way out, right? The government can do the right thing. I mean, they've never done the right thing before, so it would be unprecedented. Yeah. But the Fed could just let interest rates go up wherever they have to. You know, under Paul Volcker, we got up to 20%. We'd probably get as high, if not higher, this time. You know, if the Fed really just backed away. Mm -hmm. um, but there would be massive bankruptcies, foreclosures in the United States. A lot of the debt would just default and go away because it'd be unpayable. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of companies would go bankrupt, I mean, especially the companies that don't have any earnings and have been kept afloat by cheap money and the ability to sell equity. So a lot of companies would disappear. A lot of jobs would go away. Um, the government would be forced to dramatically reduce spending, including on things like Social Security, Medicare, Obamacare, and not to future recipients, but right now, current recipients. The government would have to say, OK, we used to send you $1,000 a month for Social Security. We're only going to send you $500 a month. So they have to reduce spending dramatically. Uh, the money's just not there. You know, um, mm -hmm. and they probably have to default on the treasury debt. Maybe not a complete default where we say you get nothing, but let's say they say, okay, everyone's going to get a 50% haircut. So if you have a hundred thousand dollar treasury, you got a $50,000 treasury or mm -hmm. what they can do is say, look, if you bought a one year treasury bill, we're still going to pay you back, but now it's a 30 year treasury bond. So you're going to get paid in 30 years, not in one month, one year. And by the way, that that 3% or 2% coupon, that's what we're going to pay you for the next 30 years. You know, you're not, you know, so so we got to find a way to restructure the debt so that it's actually payable. Uh, so a lot of things have to happen. But if we do all this and the savings rate goes up and the interest rates go up and this whole crazy bubble economy collapses, then we can have savings again. We can have capital investment. We can have productive employment. We can start making things, building stuff, have trade surpluses instead of deficits. You know, you know, we we can end up with a successful free market economy with sound money. But it, you know, it, it, we have to abandon all, everything we've been doing and 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 admit that it's been a mistake. Everything we've been doing for the decades. Mm -hmm. um, but their government really has no history of admitting to a mistake. All they do is double down on their mistakes. If something doesn't work, well, just do it bigger. Yeah. And if it so, doesn't work again, well, you, you do it, you do it bigger again. So we're just gonna just keep keep on inflating until the dollar collapses and we have you know massive inflation, and then we'll have price controls and shortages and black markets and riots and 
you know, public uh, <laughs> you know, unrest. And I mean, and, and then who knows what's going to follow that? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. You know, so but, let's, I, I do want to take us on to your favorite investment, uh, Bitcoin. So obviously with all the conditions described there, and I think that this, the financial climate has been a great time to battle test solutions, financial instruments, obviously all these like uh, economic theories that we're now seeing, we're, yeah, we're now having to pay the price. Um, and I know, I know um, Bitcoin is a contentious topic. So I'd love to hear kind of like your, your hypothesis around that. And we can, we can just go back and forth because I know this will be an interesting topic. Yeah, well, you know, Bitcoin was another thing that kind of was born out of the 2008 financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And ironically, it was part of the bubble that the central banks created in the aftermath of that crisis. Um, Bitcoin rose, you know, to spectacular uh, heights. Last in 2021, it almost hit seventy thousand dollars. You know, for for nothing, for you know, virtual nothing. Um, but you know, there were people that paid almost seventy thousand dollars for 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 one uh, token, which just you know, it's what what you're really buying. Of course, is not a bitcoin. You're buying a hundred uh, uh, billion satoshis, or whatever they are. So people were you know buying these bundles of satoshis and paying um, you know a very high price. But um, I think it's, the whole thing was, you know, a modern day uh, blockchain letter, you know, kind of uh, uh, morphist, a morph uh, kind of a combination Ponzi pyramid chain letter kind of thing uh, with <laughs> elements of each one. But, you know, it, there was a sexy story behind Bitcoin that initially gained traction in the libertarian world, the free market, uh, in agro capitalists, um, tech savvy, uh, younger people. And that's when I learned about it. I mean, I learned about the thing in 2009 or 10 or early on. And obviously I had an opportunity to make billions of dollars, you know, um, but, I knew from the beginning that it would not work. I knew that it wasn't real money, uh, that it, you know, that it had no substance and that it wasn't digital gold. I mean, I knew that, you know, people could get suckered into it. I mean, I recognized there was that potential, but I never really imagined back then, you know, that it would achieve anywhere near the success that it did for the early adopters who got in and were able to con people into paying such large sums of money uh, yeah. but I, the whole thing was really a fraud i mean they, they 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 tried to represent it as if it was some kind of digital form of gold by uh you know presenting it as if it were a coin and with the color gold uh and the way they were created they they said well you mine them even though there's no mining involved in creating bitcoins you're solving math problems so you're not actually mining anything. You're solving a problem and the reward is, is Bitcoin. And, and, and so, but the whole idea was, you know, to try to con people into thinking that this was some digital version of gold, except it was better than gold because it was more transportable. It was more divisible. It was, you know, uh, decentralized. It was non-confiscatable. There was all these things that it did to improve on gold to make it even better money than gold for the digital age. And of course, all of this missed the single most important reason that gold is money. I mean, gold uh, is good money because of its divisibility and portability and all these other properties that Bitcoin kind of tried to emulate, that, that gold does a better job than, you know, than other commodities that, that have been money over the, over the, the centuries. Uh, but first and foremost, gold is a commodity. Gold is a metal, a precious metal that is highly desirable for its uses and the things that you can do with gold. Gold is the most useful, valuable metal on the periodic table. And so because so many people want gold for so many different uses, gold has value. And one of the reasons 
that it's such a good store of value is because gold doesn't rust. It doesn't tarnish. It doesn't decay. A lot of other commodities have a shelf life. Gold has an infinite shelf life. So it's perfect for savings, which makes it great for money because it's a store of value. It's mm -hmm. a theme of deferred payment. I can borrow gold from you and I can pay you back the gold and you're going to get exactly what I bought, what, what, what you loaned me. You know, all every ounce of gold is exactly the same as so you loan me an ounce, I'll pay you back an ounce in 10 years. You're going to get the same thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it's easy as a unit of economy of exchange. Your goal was money, but Bitcoin was not. Yeah. But I recognize this fatal flaw that there has to be some underlying value uh, for something to be a store of value. You can't store what you don't have. And I knew if Bitcoin didn't have any real value, it would never uh, be able to function as money. It would never have the you know it'd be too volatile it, it just wouldn't work uh and um it has no you know relationship to any other commodities or anything else and also i pointed out when i first learned about it i said well shit, what's to stop somebody else from coming up with another cryptocurrency and just late name naming it something else and of course now there's more than twenty thousand of these things yet despite the fact that there's twenty thousand of them they still have a market cap of close to a trillion dollars you know but of course, that whole market cap can evaporate very quickly if people come to their senses and don't want to buy anymore. And, <laughs> and so so, I, I think we're we're getting ready for another uh, uh, Bitcoin crash. You know, Bitcoin's been hanging out around nineteen thousand, uh, but it's just getting ready for another big leg down. I mean, it, it's overdue, uh, and I think the next big leg down is going to be very dramatic because I do think there's a lot of leverage too in Bitcoin that hasn't been flushed out. Yeah. So well, on that note, I this debate with this guy who was also running kind of a Ponzi scheme in a Ponzi scheme, uh, you know, the guy that was doing um, what's the what's the company that blew up? Not uh, Terra, the other. Not Terra Luna or uh, Anchor Terra. or Celsius. Mishinsky, right? Another guy. Mishinsky. I yeah. don't. He had this big. Ponzi and I and I, Celsius, I remember I the debate yeah, with Celsius. Him. Yep. yeah 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 Celsius. and I had a debate with this guy and I was like look this sounds like a Ponzi to me or you're gonna collapse but I remember during that debate we start talking about leverage he goes oh there's no more leverage this is when Bitcoin is like 40 or 50 thousand oh no all the leverage is out like, what are you kidding me <laughs> this is not it's not out at all there's a lot of leverage I, there's a lot of holder holders out there that bought Bitcoin cheap but didn't want to sell it didn't want to give up the upside, didn't want to pay the taxes, so they took out loans. And their Bitcoin is collateral. And uh, when these forced margin calls come, it's going to be a implosion. Yep. And you yeah. know, there's, there's there are going to be no buyers. The market is just going to just completely implode. So I have a question about about that a little bit. So because I understand the 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 need to have some underlying um, uh, commodity or uh, collateral to to substantiate the value of said asset. Um, do you think, like in in the world today, with fiat currency and precious metals and all these complex financial instruments, do you see a value in having a universal form of digital currency that is not governed by a nation state? Yeah, look, I, I think that governments should not be involved in money. I think it's a very dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. I think money is very important and the free market should create it. If the government needs money, it could collect it through taxation. Uh -huh. We don't want government conjuring money in the thin air with a yeah. printing press. And, and so gold is the best money man has come up with. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that everybody has to lug around, you know, their gold. Gold bullion, yeah. And, you know, so the way man originally improved gold was issuing notes that were denominated gold the initial mm -hmm. notes were, were issued by the blacksmith who had gold and, and he wrote an iou and here's a piece of paper and so instead of going to the blacksmith every time you wanted your gold you could just circulate the piece of paper that was a money substitute but it was currency because it was backed by actual money so uh private banks issued uh currency backed by gold all the time. I mean, before the Federal Reserve, that's what we have. We had all these private banks all over the United States issuing currency backed by gold. And in fact, the Federal Reserve was private. That was the whole idea. It was like, let's have one private bank that would issue uh, the currencies backed by gold. 
So when you're looking at the technology that we have today, and this is where blockchain you know, can play a role, but because of the internet, because of blockchain, we don't need to issue paper that's backed by gold. We can create a cryptocurrency instead of a paper currency, and we can back that by gold. Yep. And so when you do that, and there are several of them out there, and I, you know, I was going to do something like this myself through my bank until you know it got all screwed up. And so I'm talking to several different companies now about kind of becoming involved with one of these companies that I think maybe is best position. To, to do this, but a lot of companies will be able to do it. But mm -hmm. when you issue a cryptocurrency that's backed by gold, now you have something. You have a superior form of money to any fiat currency, to any cryptocurrency, because you could take an ounce of gold and you can break it out down into 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 a millionth of a gram, right? With a crypto, and now I can take my gold ownership and transfer it anywhere in the world, basically instantaneously for nothing. Because the gold just sits there in a vault, but the ownership of that gold continues to circulate and change hands. And so gold can act as a medium of exchange, as, as a unit of account. You can price products in gold, something that you could never do in Bitcoin. It's universal money. It's one of the most uh, least volatile assets out there, uh, I can say, you know, I'm selling these widgets, and each each widget each each widget is ten grams of gold. That's my price, and so I can have customers in Europe, I can have customers in Asia and America, and they all see, oh, it's ten grams of gold. Then you know they can figure out what it is in their own currency. I don't care. I want ten grams of gold, and then you can you know you can transfer me those ten grams of gold instantly. Yeah, you know, and I'll send you my product. You know, that's it. And 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 that works way better than Bitcoin. You don't have to trust that something that has no value is going to be in demand, because gold always has value. You know, gold's a metal. Gold gold is needed in jewelry. You know, fifty percent of the demand comes from jewelry. People aren't going to stop wearing jewelry. Uh, they've been wearing jewelry for thousands of years. I mean, I don't. You know, I mean, I don't see any women on this. Uh, call here but i mean we all got girlfriends and wives they all uh, they all wear jewelry and men wear jewelry too i mean it's you know i mean mm -hmm. probably now more than ever i mean men i mean jewelry is a real status symbol for a lot of people you know in pop culture i mean gold yeah. is a big thing bling i mean so it's there but look at look at india look at look at china places that have billions of people gold is you know highly in demand it's ingrained in the culture do you so think then a, there is enough gold, gold to be able to collateralize a global decentralized sure. cryptocurrency? Sure, because you don't need a lot of gold. That's the beauty of gold. You know, it's it's scarce. There's not a lot of it, so it concentrates value in a small area. But um, yeah, you guys are in technology. I mean, you can't have a tech industry without gold. I mean, what you I mean? What's making all these chips work? What's conducting all this? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it, so it, that being said, it, do you think uh, then? like how would you manage an entity that is backing a global currency because wouldn't that entity be centralized no no it doesn't, we don't need a global currency we okay. have global money gold is money we all use it as money mm -hmm. there can be all sorts of private digital mints that create tokens that are backed by gold and people can choose which ones they want to use certain tokens will have a higher premium they'll be more recognizable just like a regular mint, you know, you got uh, the the Canadian mint makes a maple leaf. You know, the the mint in Australia makes a panda or a koala. Whatever you got, <laughs> South Africa makes the cougar and, You know, you got uh, different mints out there. The U.S. government makes the eagle, a buffalo. I mean, and then there's private mints. There's all sorts. There's hundreds of private mints that make mm -hmm. coins. Right, they're there. Yeah, I mean, I'd sell them. Yeah, and, and so now you're talking about a digital. Uh, version because a lot of people that buy gold from me they want me to store it we put it in a vault in singapore we put it in a vault in switzerland because they don't want to take you know take possession they're worried maybe someone will steal it so they leave it in a, in a vault well if you're going to leave it in a vault why not just take a digital representation of that gold while it's in a vault because if i've got let's say a hundred thousand dollars worth of gold but now i have it tokenized and I, that I have the bars sitting in a vault, and I've got these tokens. I can I'm, I got them on my cell phone. I got them on a, on a piece of plastic. 
I can I can spend them. I can mm -hmm. do what I want. And if I'm a merchant, what do I want to get paid in? Do I want to get paid in some fiat currency that's losing value? I'd rather be, be paid in real money. I'd rather be paid in gold. You know, what are the big problems there's going to be when inflation really kicks into a higher gear? Is costs are going to be going up so fast. If you're a merchant and you sell something, you may not be able to replace it because the, the money could be losing value so fast that by the time I, I'm able to take the money you give me for my product to try to re, restock my shelves, I can't afford to pay it anymore. It costs me more to rebuy it than what you just paid me for. So if I never have to touch fiat money, if I say, look, you can buy my widgets, but you got to pay for them in gold, then I don't mm -hmm. have to worry because now I have gold to buy new widgets, right? Because gold's not going to lose value. The politicians can't create gold, but they can create all the fiat they want. There's no reason to replace one fiat currency with another fiat currency. Just go back to gold because before the the dollar was the reserve, gold was the reserve. And the only reason the dollar became the reserve was because it was backed by gold and it was convertible by gold. All these foreign central banks that we convinced to hold US dollars, when we convinced them of that, we told them, hey, anytime you want your gold, just take $35, bring them on down to the Federal Reserve and we'll give you an ounce of gold. That's the deal. That was the deal we made with the world. And they said, okay, because what the world was able to do then is they would put their gold with the Federal Reserve, they would get $35 an ounce, they would take those $35, loan it to the US government by buying a treasury, and now they would get four or 5% interest. If they kept the gold themselves, they got no interest. So that was a great deal that we made with the world until we screwed the world over by defaulting. <laughs> we kept printing money, <laughs> and then when the world said, oh, you know what, we want our gold back, we just said, no, we default, you're not getting your gold back. <laughs> And, and, and you know, and then the dollar went way down, but the world kept using it. You know, the dollar lost seventy percent of its value during the nineteen seventies because of that, uh, against the yen, against the Swiss franc, against the Deutsche Mark. But you know, the next thing that's going to happen is the dollar is going to lose its status, and then that's the beginning of the end because now America is going to have to figure out how to survive uh, without a trade deficit. You know, how are we going to survive? You know, all the shelves are going to be empty. You can go into Walmart, there's going to be nothing to buy. You know? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Peter. Um, we hit the end of the hour. So I want to be respectful of your time. And I, because I know you probably have a lot going on, but I, we really appreciate, obviously, you coming and speaking to us today. Um, do you have any like parting words? I know a lot of, we've learned a lot of things today. We talked about a lot of history, a lot of direction, and where we're headed. But if you had just a couple final words, um, to share, yeah. obviously, you have a big platform here with Google, and uh, a lot of the people in the audience are, you know, enthusiastic investors in crypto, in fiat, and you know, securities, yeah, I equities. Encourage, you know, you guys to continue to listen to my podcast. If some of you are listening, great. If you're not listening to the Peter Schiff show, listen to it. Maybe give me a little help with Google and the search algorithms, and you know, <laughs> get 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 shift gold up to the top. I don't see another subprime short. I don't have that on, on the books right now. But I do think that a lot of these gold mining stocks that we own, we have a lot of port, you know mining stocks in our portfolios. I do think that we'll make actually even more money on the long side of the mining sector than we did at the short side of the mortgage sector. Because you know I made about 10x in the subprime short. I think some of our gold stocks are going to be 50 baggers, 100 baggers. You know, that's what happened during the 1970s. I mean, people made a ton of money in gold stocks in the 1970s. I mean, just a ton of money. Uh, very few people owned them, but the people that did, I mean, just made a killing. You know, think about where was gold in 1970? $35 an ounce. Where was it in 1980? $850. Think about the magnitude of that gain and what that would mean for mining companies, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, you know, there, there, there's a lot of money to be made. Plus, also, we buy a lot of value stocks. See, the problem with the U.S. stock market is most stocks are still way overpriced despite the decline. Uh, they don't have good dividends. Uh, they're not good inflation hedges. We're buying value. We're buying stocks around the world that have low PEs, high dividends, that sell products that people have to buy. We have pricing power. You know, they're going to be good inflation hedges, good stores of value. Um, you know, so that's what you got to do. You got to find good companies that you can buy at, at, a, at a good price 
um, and get a good dividend. I mean, Google's a good company, but you know, it's it's not a cheap stock. You know, see? Now, one day it will be a cheap stock. One day I might buy some Google, but not now. <laughs> so, <laughs> most better investment opportunities around the world. I mean, I use it again. I said I use it every day. It's a great product, and I do think that in this particular downturn advertising is really going to fall. I mean, companies are just going to spend a lot less on advertising. Mm -hmm. The customers don't have the money. And so if you have an advertising based business model, obviously, you know, your revenues are going to come down. If people are broke, then you, you, you know, the advertisers can't, you know, sell. In fact, you have all these advertisers trying to sell to the same group of people and they're all broke, right? They, they're maxed out on their credit cards. They, 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 they can't pay for the food or their rent or their energy bills or insurance bills. So, I mean, these businesses are in trouble. Uh, you know, the ones that don't have any earnings at all and the ones that have a lot of debt are going to go bankrupt. And that could be a, an opportunity for Google to gobble up some competitors, you know, and consolidate, uh, you know, for, for it. You know, because the companies that can survive a big downturn are going to, you know, come out a lot stronger on the other end of it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the meantime, you know, and spread the word, you know, follow me on Twitter. I had, I had a pretty, I have one successful tweet out today that's got almost 20,000 likes so far on the day. You know, I, I actually have one of the most successful, not, I don't know if successful is the right word for it, but one of the most uh, engaged tweets. I got 100,000 comments and 45 <laughs> million impressions. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was the tweet where I I, I said it was disrespectful to, for Zelensky to address Congress wearing a T-shirt. <laughs> That's and funny. so everybody wanted the virtue signal by by expressing what a rotten person I was. <laughs> well, because Peter I thought, you know, the guy was in a had a professional lighting, he had professional hair and makeup. It was all scripted. Okay, you know, you can put on a collared shirt. You're addressing Congress, first time ever, joint session. It's not like he was in a foxhole to under fire, you know. And he, <laughs> he acted like, look, oh, the guy's at war. How do you expect him to put on a jacket and tie? So, well, he's not in battle. He's got, he's got. He's a president of the country. He can ask somebody, hey, grab me a grab me a jacket and tie. Let me put it on. <laughs> anyway, but the, the, the tweet I got out today was um, is a pretty big one because uh, you know it, it, I was talking about. Kanye West or Yee, Ye, whatever his name is now. <laughs> but, um, Thanks, Peter. Um, so anyway, but follow me on Twitter. I'm getting. I, I want to get a million followers. I got almost eight hundred fifty thousand. But you know, subscribe to my YouTube channel and you know, Instagram, and I'm even on TikTok. So <laughs> nice. Well, thanks, Peter. We'll definitely send out some comms on this. We really appreciate your time. This was uh, a real sobering discussion. So I appreciate you sharing, like, obviously, all your amazing experience with us and um, a lot of big fans in the crowd. So hopefully, yeah. maybe we'll see you again in the future. And yeah. uh, next time you want to go on Wall Street and, uh, you know, uh, shake people, I will come with you. We can uh, we can do it together. Oh, yeah. That was <laughs> one, of my, one of my more successful videos, Occupy Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Bye. Peter. Take care. Bye, everybody. We'll Take see care, you next guys. time. Bye-bye.